Uh, to those of you who are just joining us now, a very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the normal game drive. This is Sydney Fumulani Mikosi and I'm traveling with Senzo, who is my camera operator, as well as uh, Koli, who has just joined us this afternoon. We are here by the western side of the Greater Kuruga National Park in Juma and I have got a very lovely mating pair. Here, something interesting has been going on. The male that we are seeing there now uh, has got a female, and this female is on a distance of about 10, 10 meters apart. Female is just leaving her sleeping spot to come and do a, a mating ritual or mating dance in order to convince a male to mate. We have seen that happening right now. This is so amazing, and we are going to be here for quite a while. Yes, the resting is hot at the moment. The female, she is not considering the temperature at the moment. She is not worried about this high temperatures every time she is interested on this male she's leaving her spot coming back to the male and talk to him so that he can do what he knows best when it comes to the breeding activities So I have seen that the male that we are watching now has got quite a lot of scratches on his face. So those scratches are a sign that this one is a fighter. For the lions, for them in order to have access to mate, there is quite a lot of fighting and some of these fightings can be very much vicious. And they can even kill each other from uh, fighting. Look at that. So you can see that now he is listening to what I'm saying. Oh, he is listening to what is happening on the surrounding. He has to be very much inquisitive uh, because sometimes competition does get very high when a female is on heat. While we are waiting to see what is going to happen, I am going to send you very far Botswana, where Steph is by the Chobe National Park. Now, as I'm talking to you, he's with the elephants. Coming down to drink on the bank of the river and we've just caught them as they have come out of the bush I with it while drinking this plant is so small this is a herd of elephant now we've got a bit of a signal problem in this particular area, so you will apologize. Oh, I will, I will apologize right now, and you will excuse us, please, for uh, for that. We are coming to you live right now from the Chobe River in northern Botswana, and the odd glitch in uh, in signal is expected. But these elephants, the last time that they drank, might have been yesterday, and they've come down out of the forest thirsty, and I just piling the water into their trunks. Now, the reason why we're not driving too close just yet is because they haven't drunk for the whole day. And if for some reason they are uh, a bit more skittish, if we were to just drive right up to them and they then walked away, we could completely disturb them. And that's not really what we want to do. So we're just going to let them drink a little bit and then we gauge their mood and we gauge what they're doing and then we'll start the boat again and we'll move a little bit closer and we'll see if we can get a little bit closer. Right now the wind has picked up and is blowing us actually away from the elephant. Let's see if now that they've had something to drink they have a bath. Wouldn't it be spectacular if they had a bath right here by us? Blue water, green grass, blue sky, green trees, white teeth, really quite cool. Rosalind, you'd like to know how many elephants are by the Chobe River. Rosalind, in the Chobe National Park, there are 50,000 elephants, and in Botswana, there are 135,000 elephants. How many elephants are exactly on the Chobe River is dependent on the season. Right now, this is the wet season, full of grass, and there are puddles of water lying out in the bush, and so you don't have a lot of elephant coming down to the river. But by October, September, October, thousands of elephant will be uh, will be on the Chobe River. And by thousands, I mean 20 or 30,000 elephant will be on this stretch of the river. Now, a lot of you this morning uh, saw quite a disturbing sight of a young Ellie with something wrong with it. We don't know what was wrong with it, but it had something wrong with it. And it, 
it was turning around in circles. I just want to reassure you that um, we came back about an hour later and the elephant had moved off. And so it either got over what it was, uh, what it, what was wrong with it, or it managed to, uh, to, to move off into an area where we couldn't see it. But the other reassurance that I want to give you is that uh, an elephant conservation group was on site. They had their researchers on site and they'd been told about it. And, uh, and they were monitoring the situation. So while I don't have any more information for you than that, I can reassure you that we didn't see the elephant an hour later. And, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, and that secondly, the, the uh, elephant conservationists were on site with their scientists. And uh, I had a look with my binoculars into the car and it was a very somber group of people inside that car. And so very serious. So, Serious scientists are always doing the best things. So we're going to try and get a little bit closer. The wind is playing havoc with us. We have got a, a sun shield over the over the the boat, and it acts like a bit of a sail. And so when the wind blows, we we blow all over the place, and it gets a little bit difficult to uh, to see these elephants. But in actual fact, we've got more than one herd of elephants here. We've actually got this group here, which would be one herd, head head up by a matriarch, and then behind them we have got another herd as well. So hopefully we get to see two herds of elephant. Um, excuse me while I just call Kirsty back. We're using cell phones here. And I managed, my leg managed to switch the phone off. And so Kirsty's gonna come back. Well, hello. There we go, they're having a bath, look at that. So the youngsters are lying down in some mud. That's exactly what we wanted to see. So now that they've slaked their thirst and are still relaxed, we are getting to see them having a bath. Now, Fancy Cheetah, you'd like to know if, uh, if these are forest elephants. Uh, no, these aren't just the normal African or savanna elephant, uh, Loxodonta africana or the cusped tooth African elephant. And, um, and so not the forest elephant, which is one slightly different and that you find in the tropical forests of Central Africa. Here comes the next herd. Here comes the next herd at the top there. I don't think that they'll be drinking in the same place. I can't imagine that they would. But it's not uncommon for herds to be uh, within a couple of dozen yards of one another, all on this river frontage and all having the best time. So there's a bit of a mud wallow there. Puma, you'd like to know if it's true that elephants hunt uh, uh, excuse me, that lions hunt elephants uh, along the Chobe River. Um, Puma, you're not too far from the truth, except that it's not on the Chobe River, it's in the Savuti Marsh, which is part of the Chobe National Park. Um, so in Savuti, which lies on the other side of the, of the Chobe National Park, so south of where we are now, south and a little bit west, is an area called the Savuti Marsh. There are a lot of elephant there and large prides of lion, and those prides of lion do hunt full-grown elephant. Here on the banks of the Chobe River I've never heard of it but there are large prides of lion here and because it gets so hot and because this is the Kalahari, look at that, that female just going, no thank you, stop being a pain and push you into the water. Now we've got other other boats on the river with us. It's not an exclusive place, the, uh, the Chobe River, very similar to the Mara Triangle. There's lots of people that uh, have boats and come for safaris and, and have tourists that come for safaris. You yourself could book a boat cruise out of one of the hotels and uh, enjoy exactly what we're seeing here um, relatively easily. Just look at this one having a mud bath. So now once they've slaked their thirst and the dehydration problem is taken care of, they can cool down and they cool down by spraying their back of their ears where all their blood vessels are to cool them down with water and mud and then by spraying their skins with mud the water evaporates and that cools them down but it also adds a protective layer of mud for any biting insects and parasites and I think it must feel so fantastic to have a mud bath. I think this elephant's probably going to lie down. You can see how they're kicking the mud, kicking the bank to loosen the mud up, sucking the mud up in the trunk.
Nice question, Becky. You've asked what animals are we likely to see here that we won't see in Juma and the Mara. Becky, sable antelope comes to mind for, um, in the forefront. And then there is an endemic bushbuck that lives here called the Chobi bushbuck. It looks exactly the same as the bushbuck that you'd see uh, in the Mara or, or rarely in the Mara uh, or a Juma, except that it's a lot redder with much bolder white markings on it. And it's because the Chobi River is a unique feature. There's almost no valleys, no rivers joining the Chobi River for hundreds of kilometers in any direction. So bushbuck have come along the river. And when you come along the river and you are using the population behind you to seed populations in front of you, you can go through some evolutionary changes, some basic evolutionary changes through inbreeding. And that inbreeding has now um, made a different subspecies of bushbuck called the Chobi bushbuck and the Chobi bushbuck in turn is quite endangered mainly because elephant numbers in the Chobi National Park have increased dramatically and they've had a drastic uh, effect on the vegetation next to the river and there's not the habitat left anymore for the Chobi bushbuck so they do occur in isolated pockets in fact David and I saw one this morning uh, walking down to come and join you so they are around I mean we've only been here for two days and we managed to see one um, there's the other elephant herd in the background there. They're very respectful of one another elephant. One herd won't come and drink at another herd. They'll, they stand a little bit of a distance apart. And that back herd of elephant might be exactly the same as, uh, as this herd that came down. They could also only have drunk yesterday last. And today's been a really hot day. They could have walked far. But because elephants are so respectful of one another, they didn't just rush in. They waited a little bit for the elephant in front of them to finish drinking and then they came down even though they've got kilometers of river frontage over here and now they're moving off mud wallow done you might find that these elephant the second group of elephant are waiting for a the same mud puddle Kirsty tells me that all of you are saying that this is so awesome i agree it is properly awesome now they're joining there's some kudu in the background there as well, some female kudu. Wow, look at that. Isn't that awesome? Large group of elephant. Definitely is not one herd of elephant. You probably find that the two old matriarchs are sisters with one another and they've joined their herds together. The two oldest cows will be matriarchs of their own herds. Wow, that boat, that's how you, that's what exactly what it looks like where we are right now. Debbie, you've asked if it's a challenge for David to film on the river. Today, it's a challenge for David to film on the river. Yesterday and this morning, not so much. And the reason is that the wind creates a choppiness, which makes it difficult. The boat's always moving and it, it is quite difficult, especially when the subject is small. But as you can see from the shot that you've got now, David's doing a fantastic job uh, of giving you the best view possible with the equipment that we have. And luckily the wind has died down and there's not too many waves and it isn't blowing our sail our sailing ship around here a lot. So it's sort of like a mixture between filming on bushwalk and filming on a vehicle. We haven't quite decided yet which one it's closest to, to be honest with you. Now comes the other herd to drink. So you can see now that the wet elephant have moved to the back and the dry elephant have moved to the front. So the herds have split now. The two sisters taking their families apart and oh just look at that i mean that must be the most glorious mouthful of water that you can imagine refreshing to the nth degree and let's see if they come in for a swim elephants have favorite swimming spots you can just hear them sloshing in the water there Notice, pick an elephant and watch the elephant. They won't stick their trunk deep into the water. They just take the surfaced water, that is the cleanest water, and they, they lie their trunk along the top of the water and then slurp in the water. So watch, watch an elephant. 
moving. They flap the, the dust and the debris out of the way and then suck up the cleanest water. Elephant are very particular about the, the quality of the water that they drink. Given the opportunity to, they'll even dig for water rather than taking dirty water. But this Chobi water is beautiful. Brenda, you'd like to know if I've noticed missing tails and trunks like, on, like we have in the Mara so often. Brenda, um, yes, I've noticed one elephant this morning with a half, with a half tail. Um, we haven't been here long enough for me to really make a fair appraisal on that. I can say though that the elephant that I've seen so far, and we've probably seen about 40 to 50 elephant, uh, with the exception of one, um, have all been perfect. In fact, even these elephant, uh, that are oh, this one swimming, a youngster, two swimming. Look at him on his side. Look, look, look. In the middle, Dave. No. Oh, there we go. Having a proper splash. Shame, Ray. It just, it looks like the best water. It looks, you know, when elephant come into water, it honestly looks like. They turn, it's their favorite place. Like they haven't seen water in a whole month and this is the best water they've ever seen in their whole life. All of them flapping their ears to cool themselves down. Elephant generate a massive amount of metabolic heat and the sun here is intense. And so those ears are helping them cool down and you'll notice that as soon as the thirsts are slaked, the very next thing that they do is they splash those radiators just look at that young Eli in there. He is having a proper swim. Head under, rolling around. Nature girl, will crocodiles not attack these Ellies? Um, you know, it's not uncommon. It's, it's, it's rare, but it's not uncommon for crocodiles to have a go at young elephant. Uh, but I would say that with the amount of elephant that come down to this river and the amount of incidents that you hear about, that it's highly unlikely that we will, we will get, to see, uh, get to see that. Oh, they're going for a swim. Even the big ones are swimming. You know, I'm not even joking to you that when we got into the boat today, the first and only thing that Emily asked to see was a swimming elephant. And so, well done, Em. Well done, Kaza. <laughs> We've got a few others on the boat with us today. And uh, seeing elephants swimming in the Chobe River is just one of those things that you only really ever see pictures of. And to experience this live firstly and with you secondly is really special. To be here in the flesh is also just a remarkable privilege. I think that they swim a little longer. There's that one, there's two there having a proper swim with each other. So we're just busy maneuvering the boat, which is all the sound that you're hearing coming up from here. These boats, just like our Land Rovers, do take an immense battering with the waves and everything that they get forced into. And so there are a few rattles and squeaks and, you know, who can forgive them for that? Here comes an old bull, or a youngish bull, actually, excuse me. Not an old bull, a bull elephant in his middle to late teens he's been trailing behind the the group and he will come and have his swim after the rambunctious kids have finished at his leisure and then follow the herd out wherever they're going to go but now we've got four elephant there we go having a swim look at that now the wind has picked up so it's going to be shifting us around a bit so it is going to move a bit All right, we've just uh, we've just included some more of you onto uh, onto what the sighting is that we're having at the Chobe River here, northern Botswana, on the border between Namibia and Botswana. We've got two herds of elephant, and they've both come down to the river to drink, and we are enjoying them swimming, which is all we really wanted to see today. This was the mission today: to come and find some elephant, come and find some elephant swimming, and voila, we have some elephant swimming for you. And uh, I don't know if they're going to get all the way in. I'm hoping that they get all the way into the, the water. 
and come for a swim out into the channel. Elephants are really good swimmers. They don't need to stand. And in fact, they can even submerge completely and stick their trunks out. Nikki, you asked, can the elephants cross the entire river? Absolutely. They can swim dozens of kilometers out. Look at this one going into the water. That's how deep the water is. Wow. It actually shelves quite amazingly. Or is he sitting down? I don't know. Judging from those babies that we can see over there, I would imagine that this elephant on the left is actually sitting down and just splashing himself while he's busy sitting on a sandbank. Oh, look, they're going to start playing with each other. And there he goes under the water like a submarine. Throwing their heads around. A proper game. Marky, you say this is amazing. It is amazing, you know, Marky. It's actually quite rare to see elephants swimming like this, to be honest with you. It's not a common sight to see lots of elephant in the water, especially not uh, in the, well, I mean, it's, you know, why not? Here comes this big guy. I've lost Kirst again. He's also torpedoing. That is so cool. I mean, that is an enormous animal. There's that one elephant was under, he was blowing some bubbles with his trunk there on the far left hand side. He's gonna disappear, let's see, he's gonna do a tumble turn. Gone. Whole elephant, there he sticks his head out again. Yes, isn't that the best thing? Ah, Kirsty says that you're saying thank you for bringing this to you. It is our pleasure to bring this to you. It's, uh, honestly, it's not, it's, uh, it really is our pleasure, our privilege to do it. And so glad that you can share it where you are. So that big guy, he's now come into the water. He's slaking his thirst as well. That's not a full-grown male elephant. He's still a teenager. Late teens, I would imagine. Probably somewhere between 17 and 20 years old. Not a big elephant at all. Ah, there's one giving a big trumpet. I wonder how long this guy's going to go. Bocom, you say, wow, you're watching this from Botswana. Okay. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> now what's happening? That one now is kicking with his back legs. This other elephant is just completely submerged, sitting on his bum. Look at this. It's just an elephant's head out of the water. I almost feel like I want to punch the sky. And go, yes, we've done it. There he goes, gone. Four ton elephant, upside down. <laughs> See this one there. Let's have a look at this elephant. There's an elephant there, I promise. That's his back. And here he goes. This is the big guy that came running in last. Let's see what he does. I'm actually quite amazed at how deep the channel is. I was expecting it to be a... There we go. Someone getting disciplined. This is just so cool. Here's another elephant on the bank. Also a young male. There's a good chance that these two young males actually... There he goes under the water. Goodbye. It's a song about a yellow submarine. <laughs> Blowing it out. Just cooling down. Just really... Got some more here, also turning circles. This is the most fantastic swim I've ever seen, to be honest with you. They're just having so much fun. Obviously vitally important for elephant to cool down. They can actually die of heat exhaustion. And in Botswana, it's not uncommon to find elephant dead from dehydration, heat stress, heat stroke. And so being able to swim is just fantastic. Dina, you'd like to know if we ever see big cats here by the river? We absolutely do, Dina. Uh, depending on the, the season, now in late summer, it's not that common to see lion or leopard on the side of the river. The vegetation is very thick and there's, the animals are quite dispersed. But as soon as the dry season comes, as soon as the animals start concentrating on these banks where, you know, food is scarce anyway, but this is where they're getting their hydration from, then we, we do pick up or there is an increase. There he goes again. There is an increase in uh, in cat activity, but it is quite difficult to see. Uh, oh, look at that guy! 
It is quite difficult to see Lion from the river, to be honest. There he goes. He did a backflip. Now he's doing a side flip. He did a full roll, that elephant, did he? Didn't see. That is just really cool. He's blowing some bubbles. They become very playful when they're in water, especially two males of a similar age will sometimes spend up more than an hour swimming with each other. Makeup girl, you'd like to know if there's any other pans and things deeper into the forest. Uh, that's a good question. The Savuti Marsh does have a little bit of water in, but it is, well, I want to say about 100 kilometers away, maybe 200 kilometers away. There will be little pans and springs inside the forest, but, you know, scattered few and far between. The sands of the Kalahari, the Kalahari Basin, and the sand that has filled it over the last 180 million years or so, is very very deep and there are not a lot of springs there are springs springs uh, do occur but they're not a lot of them and so water sources like the chobi river and the kavango river and the okavango swamp and the zambezi river are really the only sources major sources of water an elephant will walk up to 50 kilometers away from this river to find enough food during the day. So as the dry season progresses and the food close to the river runs out, the elephants have to range further and further away to a point where they don't even bother walking anymore. And in October, you just have elephant the whole day just standing next to this river and just waiting for the rains to come, just waiting for that vegetation to come back because the, the amount of vegetation needed to sustain them costs more from a metabolic point of view to go and get 50 kilometers away then it would be just relying on your body's reserves. Let's see what these guys are going to do. I have a feeling, let's hold thumbs. And these guys will, the big guy will come and let his friend come and swim. Now, I just want to say thank you to all of our viewers that hopped on board. Thank you for joining us for the, uh, this. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Now what we might find is that this young male with the broken tusks actually gets into the water with a slightly bigger male. Look at them sizing each other. Yeah, that's just teenage hormones. Might have a bit of a wrestle. You can see that the one's tusks are beautiful and the other one's tusks are broken off and quite stubby. It's very common in Botswana, funnily enough, we haven't seen much evidence of it in the last two days, but it's very common in Botswana to find elephant with broken tusks. They, their tusks are quite brittle and can be quite short and, and broken off. Uh, and it's because of the vitamin deficiency in, uh, in uh, the vitamin deficiency in the vegetation here. They just don't get enough from this Kalahari bush and so their tusks break off and you don't get the long, beautiful ivory that you do in the Kruger National Park. The Kruger Park obviously has uh, some of the elephants with the longest, most beautiful ivory. These two guys are having a wrestle with one another, as we thought they might do. Bless you. That wasn't a hippo. <laughs> Let's see what they're going to do. I don't think they're going to have a proper wrestle with one another. I think if this youngster, this, the dry youngster got into the water, we might be lucky and they'll start playing with each other in the water. But the herd has now had its swim, it's had its dust bath, it's had its mouth full of water, and they will now move off to go and find a place to feed in the late afternoon. They'll have a nice leap this afternoon, spend the morning feeding tomorrow, and probably be back down at the river at some point in the afternoon tomorrow for a drink. If possible, elephant needs to drink every day. They, they just like us, they can deteriorate very quickly without sufficient hydration. Really cool. Go away bird shouting in the distance. Now we're going to take our cue from that go away bird saying go away and we're going to go away for a while. You are off uh, to Isaac with the sausage tree pride. Welcome everybody to the Mara Triangle in the Masai Mara and here I have members of the sausage tree pride all five females but i cannot 
count how many cups I do have. All of them look like they are gonna go for something tonight or later on because everybody is on the lookout for the next meal. In case you're just joining us for the first time, my name is Isaac and on camera I have Achi and we have the sausage tree pride. Um, in the Mara at the moment, temperatures are about 28 degrees Celsius and it's all perfect, good conditions for game viewing. Welcome once again. The sausage tree pride are getting ready to do something. I don't know, you know, what they're gonna go for tonight, but definitely they do need a meal. They haven't eaten a good meal for about more than two weeks. And these lionesses, we know them very well to be very good buffalo hunters. And the last one they had, it was about two weeks. They've been surviving on little meals of warthogs because at this time of the year it is the most abundant most other antelopes will leave the areas and find areas with shorter grass making it difficult for these females so they have to make do with only big game and uh, that is one of the older cubs he is around six months and he is been following you know the pride everywhere they've been going and he's still you know very dependent with milk so you know those days that they haven't eaten well they've been drinking here you can tell that that female is very focused on something um she, they can see much better than us and um looks like who is that looks like it's a meaty um looks like meaty she's usually got very box ears uh, i think it's her and uh, like yawn super super yeah you don't want to get in between those teeth um, because you won't you won't leave to tell the tale beautiful look at that very healthy looking Janet um, um, I didn't hear the whole question but I had you know if they hunted last night no, they didn't hunt. They hunted about three days ago, but we don't know exactly what they ate because I found them and then my colleague um, David found them also. They had eaten, so we are not sure what they ate, but definitely it wasn't big because we didn't come across the carcass. So they will need to find something quite soon, if not tonight, tomorrow, because all of them have cubs and to produce milk they need to eat so they will need to eat as soon as possible yeah kinky the oldest lioness is up and she's walking that is kinky tail there yeah that is the mother of all these females um we estimate you know she's um heading towards around maybe around in eight years uh, but so nobody's quite sure and all the rest are her daughters and they all have cubs so the pride at the moment is getting big big this is what you know the only time that you know um, lions socialized when they need they socialize when they need each other when eating they can be rough towards each other remember to join me to join me on um, Twitter at hashtag safari life and you can you know you can watch us on YouTube live stream or tell a friend to tell a friend to you know you know see this wonderful amazing live broadcast straight from the Masai Mara yeah you know while you know these guys you know start getting ready to head out um, before they get play very playful let me send you to Steve who's got a nice bird for you guys Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Buffalo Watering Hole. My name is uh, Steve. I'm joined by Sebastian. Well, the Choby seems to be stealing the show this afternoon. We've been driving around for ages. And, well, obviously, we haven't been as exciting or interesting as Steph on the boat, of course. How exciting is it to have him out there on the Choby just listening to all of the elephants doing their thing? 
priceless, priceless. Let's go and have a look at some beautiful birds. We've got the spoonbill on the right over there. So I was talking this morning about how when I was in Lewandi in Malawi in the Shiri River, which is pretty similar, I suppose, to um, the Chobi River, one of those very permanent, fast-flowing waters. And uh, the boat cruises we did there were incredible. You could get right up close and personal with the Ellies. It was really something very, very special. Excuse me. Very, very special indeed. So I am a little bit jealous of Steph at the moment, but if it works out, which I hope it will, maybe we'll all be rotating out and going to Chobe. I've never been to northern Botswana. Well, everybody, bearing in mind, we are interactive and we'd love to hear from you. How about, I don't know if Steph has prompted one, let's do a one-word tweet on your thoughts on the Chobe. One-word tweet, hashtag Safari Live, on your thoughts of the boat trips on the Chobe. Send them through and let's get a little bit of an idea of what all of you back home are thinking. No doubt, very excited to be seeing a new environment. And I must admit, it is also lovely to see Steph on the other side of the camera again. I was talking to him the other day, and he's like, I haven't been on the camera in a year. I don't know if I remember how to do it. And I just had to laugh at him. It's like a bicycle, isn't it? It's like a bicycle. And here we've got the yellow-billed stalk. Very deliberate movements through the water. Very red face with a long yellow beak looking for any movements of any aquatic aquatic insects or bird or fish frogs oh wow we what just watched a kill everybody how incredible now that's what's amazing while he was talking about how the beaks of these birds are almost like sandpaper I mean, I've watched kingfishers stand on a branch and basically just flip a fish around and fish around and flip it around and swallow and try to swallow and then flip it around. And, and have you ever tried to deal with a fish in your hands? They are so slippery. So all these birds do have to have a very, very well adapted beak so as to be able to hold whatever it is that they catch in the water. And then they still need to be able to flick it back into their mouth bearing in mind that none of these birds have got teeth. That animal, that organism, generally goes straight into their crop, still moving and wriggling around inside of the animal's neck area. It must be the weirdest feeling in the world to put a live organism inside your throat pouch, the crop, where it will eventually get sort of crushed uh, by potentially some muscular action, or the crop actually is not where the muscular action is. That's where it gets stored. But later on, when it goes through the gizzard, there's a muscular movement there whereby whatever it is that goes in gets crushed up, squashed, and then obviously goes through the digestive system. The crop working, or the gizzard working very much like our teeth. If that you say magnificent about the chovy, and I can't agree more, uh, please keep sending them through. Let's hear what the rest of you out there are saying about the chovy. No doubt... Everyone is really excited for the possible new venture up there. Leanne, you say special. It is indeed special. To be able to jump from the Maasai Mara and the open plains to the fast or the, the medium slow pace moving waters of Chobe National Park and then to come down here to Juma, where, well, this time of year... We are having a pretty quiet time of year because of the rain and the thickets. But the rain has blessed the Chobe with high waters as we leave our heron. We're going to go back to the Chobe River to see what amazing birds and creatures Steph has got for you. We have got something so amazing to show you. What you're having a look at there is my ugly face but we'll go back to uh <laughs> go back to the, this nest here this is a fish eagle's nest and at the bottom of the fish eagle's nest is a huge african honeybee hive now uh, you'll punch in there in a bit and you'll see that that you'll you'll punch in there and you'll see in a little bit that that entire yellowy orange gold mass at the top of this jackalberry is a beehive and just covered in countless thousands. Sound is one. How's that? Okay, so 
So there's just something with the sound over here that's happened. Apparently you can still hear me on the ambient mic. So we're going to try and do that a little bit. So right now what we're going to do is just show you that beehive at the top there. Ah, oh, we've got it all back. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. I'm sitting too close to the edge of the boat or something. You'll excuse us for these small little exploratory, uh, exploratory foibles that we're finding out. You know, like don't sit too close to the aluminium boat because it switches off your microphone. While we have a look at uh, at that just absolutely astounding uh, uh, sighting. I've never seen an African beehive like that out in the open or as exposed as that. And I suppose when you're that size, when your colony is that size, what do you actually have to fear? And Kaiser was telling us that uh, that, that beehive is only about a year old and already is at that size. It shows you what water lily, what water lilies, how much ne nectar water lilies and all the grass here produces. Can you imagine? A honey is produced by, by bees mixing pollen with saliva and water, but over and over again, letting it dry out, remixing it dry out, remixing it dry out. And so honey is a very viscous um, dis distillate, really, of, uh, of nectar, saliva, and water. And the bees feed their larvae on it. The larvae are kept inside a wax cell and fed on the honey. And as the beehive grows, more and more larvae are produced, and so more and more cells are made. And you can see that they build them in those fins. And that's because the hive must be kept at a very, uh, must be kept at a, at, a, at, a, at a decent temperature, very similar to how termite mounds are kept at a decent temperature. Uh, beehives must be kept at a, at a temperature, and those fins help to radiate out heat. Now, Penny Pine, you want to know if, uh, if honey hunters will come and harvest this honey. Uh, it's unlikely, Penny Pine. The reason for that is that this is inside the Chobe National Park and people are not allowed to harvest uh, any, any, any uh, natural-based products out of the Chobe National Park. It would be considered poaching. And we're very close to a police post, an outpost here. And so I think that these bees are probably about as safe as they can get. And, and I think that that is contributing to its massive size. I mean, even from where we are now, we can hear it. If we're very quiet, do you think, Dave, you'll be able to get the noise of the buzzing? I can hear it. David says that he can hear it, so if, I'll keep quiet now and just listen. can just hear it okay i'll start talking again now it's useless you all straining your ears to try and hear and then i blast your eardrums away by coughing or sneezing or something isn't that just amazing i've never seen a beehive that size not african bees at least anyway in fact i've never seen a beehive that size in person i'm amazed at how it's holding on you know that thing must weigh five or six kilograms maybe more Janice, how long is this beehive? I would say it's probably about a meter, um, maybe just less than a meter, so three feet or so, two and a half to three feet, and then another two feet wide at its widest point, and with many, many fins. And somewhere in there will be a single queen, and she would have laid all the, all the bees that you're looking at now, she would have laid the eggs for, they cased, similar to how termites and ants are cased. In other words, she decides that she needs to have worker bees and worker bees are born. And she decides that she needs to have bees that tend her and her body and they are born. And ones that tend or nursery bees and then they are, are born. So, wow. Oh, Laura Moore, you'd like to know if there's any bee eaters here. Yes, there are the honey guides, greater and lesser as far as I know. I'll double check that now. And then we also have lots of honey badges here as well. So there'll be, there'll be all the honey guides. I'll see if there's anything more. Let me just have a double check here. 
Honey Guide 32. It's just a page in my book. Not 32 different species. Right, so Greater Honey Guide, definitely. Um, and let's just see. Well developed woodland of the scaly throated honey guide. Looks like it occurs here. Or no, that doesn't occur here. Definitely lesser honey guard and brown backed honey guard. Brown backed honey guard we get here as well. So brown backed honey guard, green backed honey guard, green backed honey guard. So here we go. Many more honey guards than I thought. So we've got the greater honey guard. That is the greater honey guard. We've got the lesser honey guard, which is that one. We've got the brown backed honey guard, that one, and the green backed honey guard. So, of the six honey guards on the page, we have four of them that occur just yet. Now, honey guards eat the larvae, the bee larvae, um, and to a degree the wax as well, but the, the bee larvae mostly. And, but because they really can't get into beehives, they need, in some cases, humans and in some cases, honey badgers to open the nests for them. In this particular case, I would imagine that if the honey guard is, uh, is um, quick enough, he'd be able to pick up any scrap morsels that it could get. All right, we're going to carry on with our safari and see what's around the next corner. You never really know what is around the next corner here. In the meantime, we're going to be sending you back to those uh, mating lines. Uh, the mating pair is so very much tired at the moment as you all know that they've got to mate for approximately four times an hour if you can count that for about five to six consecutive days it is going to be about more than 250 times 250 times of mating that is too much so the males the territorial life is difficult because if another male comes here now when he's tired like this he is going to fight the intruder and if the intruder wins the battle the intruder is going to carry on with the female sometimes the females they've got to be loyal and sometimes they are not loyal i am saying this because i know if the there is some cubs and there is a new male coming in in order to take over they can go on what is called a false ostras here is where the females are going to pretend as if they are on ostras just to keep the male busy so that they can protect their little ones so you can see that here in the bush life is so very much uh, difficult So you can see how that male is lying down, that um, he's opening the hind legs so that he can be able to expose the body for in case if this flees, so that the sun can be able to chase away the parasite. Oh, <laughs> maybe he had me, you can see now. He's, <laughs> he's just close at leg now. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's listening to me. So the female is also lying down, not very far away from uh, that male. And please don't get surprised. I am not alone by the sighting at the moment. I do have some other guests who are enjoying this spectacular sighting. I can see now he's on a very deep sleep. But lions can tend to become very active quickly. If anything comes here now when it's lying down flat like that, you're not going to believe that it is the very same lion who is sleeping at the moment. <laughs> now that is true, Rosina, I am with you. It is so difficult here in the wild. So the animals, they do develop quite a lot of adaptations in order to save themselves and also in order to protect their little ones. So imagine a female going on false ostras. <laughs> that is something else. It is amazing. These lions, the females, they know the consequences because males, 
will come and do what is called infanticide. Here is where they are going to kill the babies of the previous males so that they can be able to drive Ostra cycle on females to go back on heat so that they can start their own generation. So, but that shows that males as well are so clever because they know what to do in order to provoke the hormones. So naturally, they know what is expected of the males just to change the interest of the female. The male looks like he's part of the avoca. When looking at him, I can see he's got quite a lot of scratches. And this male, he looks like a male I have seen before mating with one of the females from the avoca pride. I saw him earlier on. He just stood up and walked a little bit. He was limping. And the fact that he was limping does not necessarily mean that he is injured. Sometimes because of lying down by the difficult terrain, when they wake up because of long hours, it's not like the bed. Here is difficult. So you will see them limping for a while. And after that, they will be walking very nicely. So he is part of the Avoca coalition, not an Avoca pride. <laughs> we don't have the Avoca pride yet. We've got the Avoca coalition, which is normally dominating the Unkuhuma pride. So now let's cross over to one of my friends. Welcome back. And my girls are getting ready to do something. They're all glued to some heart beast that are, are at a distance because there's nothing else. I'm thinking they will go for that because it's the only available thing at the moment. You can tell that all the females, oh, look at that beautiful cattle egrets are just flying, flying past everybody. That is limpy and two of her cubs and then the other, you know, one, the other cub belongs to another female. The limp has come back and we will be sharing with you um, her limp. We know her for having this limp for a very long time. It never goes away, it heals. Then when it's almost going away, something happens and it comes back. I think it was a broken bone that never got to heal well. And every time she chases something, she injures it and it comes back so it never heals and i just noticed that she is very very limpy today in fact she wasn't putting any weight on that leg um i don't know what happened earlier on i don't know if this morning whoever was watching saw her with the injury i don't know if i didn't ask david i don't know if she had the injury remember to engage me um on hashtag safari live um if you want to know something about the sausage tree pride, I'm more than um, pleased to tell you one thing or two that I know about this beautiful pride of lion that um, we have been following for quite a while and um, they always given us opportunities to experience lion life. Finak, thank you, and it's uh, always a pleasure to hear your name, and I enjoy your questions very much. Um, you asked me if she's got enough milk uh, for the cubs, or she needs to hunt. No, she doesn't have enough milk, and she will need to get something quite soon, because um, if she waits long, uh, it's, the cubs might become very desperate, and she might become very weak which is going to make the situation even worse. So she doesn't have milk and she will need to hunt either tonight or tomorrow. I'm hoping that, you know, they can get something. It's, um, it's not always, you know, um, happy for the other side, uh, whoever is going to be hunted, but lions have to eat. And you can tell, you know, most of them right now are looking quite thin. They haven't had a good meal for over two weeks. So uh, they don't have milk and you can tell, you know, look at how, you know, um, fix, fix, you know, they're fixed to that, uh, those hearty beast at a distance they're looking. Yeah. 
yes, you see, you know how, you know, they're not, you know, they don't have anything at all in their bellies. Okay, I'm gonna be here. Uh, let me send you, send you to some other things, you know, uh, to Steph, who's got some hippos, some birds in the Chobe in Botswana. I also, for your sake, hope that the lions are going to be hunting. Look at what we got here, a completely unique view of hippo at crocodile eye level, at grass level. And uh, these three hippo have been feeding on the grass. It seems like they've been feeding here since we've got here yesterday. It was obviously, it's, it's, uh, they haven't. This one hippo is quite shiny. In fact, I actually just want to see if that's water or if it's nor hippo sudoric acid that they have leaking off of themselves. It's water. Brent, you'd like to know if hippos are dangerous to the boats here. They do pose a significant risk, Brent, um, but the guides here are really well experienced, really well trained, and from what I've seen at least, very respectful of hippos in their spaces. Uh, they're given lots of space, and while they no doubt represent a, 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 a threat to, uh, excuse my lackadaisical uh, posture I have over here. I'm actually just anchoring the boat on the bank, which is why my shoes are there. <laughs> it's not because I'm trying to be funny. Um, but yeah, Brent, it's it's basically uh, they do pose a significant risk, but the training and the experience of the guys make all the difference out here. And so accidents are few and far between, and in, you know dangerous encounters between man and hippos, thankfully, uh, um, you know, it, it, there, but. Uh, they don't deal with it. Nice hippos. Generally speaking, hippos can actually eat almost all of their, their food requirements in a very short space of time, and they'll go spend the rest of the time in the water. Here, however, it's we just even though there's an abundance of grass and there's an abundance of clean water, we see hippo out of the water here all the time. And I think it's because I don't even know what it's because. I'm going to take a guess at why we see hippo out the water here. And they're just reducing competition for the same food source, I think. Um, so it's one just, you know, hippos don't need to socialize when they're feeding as much and they're just making use of a much, uh, they don't have to walk as far. And so they pick when they want to eat, basically. Um, and then also, I think it's, it's there are just so many hippo here uh, that, you know, we're just seeing them a lot more frequently. And hippo is very shiny. Now hippo do have glands that leak an, an acid sun cream come antibacterial sort of pinkish fluid from their skin. That hippo, I don't know, do you think it's sweating or do you think it's just water, Dave? I think it's water. I also think it's water. Normally it dries to this like sticky orange reddish color. Hi okay, Katie, you just asked a question. Uh, why do we think the hippo are so much more out of the water here than they are at Juma? Katie, I think it's just the sheer number of hippo. We just, the chances of seeing a hippo out the water is that much higher. And so we're seeing them out of the water more. I also think that the, just the overabundance of really good quality food here means that hippo don't only need to um, feed on these things at night altogether. They can feed whenever they feel like it really. And because they're close to the water, when they start getting hot, they can just pop in. Um, so I definitely think that it's, uh, I don't know this answer for true, it's what I think, at least anyway. So I think it's one of those, or even a combination of those two, uh, of those two, two circumstances. But I mean, it, it is a good and noteworthy observation that, in that we do see a lot more hippo here out the water than I've seen in a lot of places. Um, and even when I'm contrasting what I've seen in the South Luangwa National Park, which is many, many more hippo than here, um, there you also don't see many hippo out of the water during the day. But it's because it's a drier habitat, I think, and they have to walk a lot further to get food, and they'll choose to do that at night in case they overheat. Here, they don't have to worry. They can eat a little bit when they feel like it, and then just pop back into the water when they're getting too hot. So lots of food and lots of hippo. And a nice sighting. But to these hippos sort of moving off into the grass, it does give us the opportunity to move on and for you to go back to Isaac's hunting lions.
Okay, um, it is very windy, as you can see the grass moving, and also maybe you might be hearing it. It's even shaking the vehicle slightly. Um, looks like, you know, somebody might get some rain somewhere, and the clouds are being pushed towards the border, quite a long ways away. That is um, Limpy, she's up, but I don't think she can do much. This is the leanest I have seen her. She is usually very, very healthy. Her coat, coat is still perfect, but she is quite thin, um, according to the way we know her. But still, very regal, very healthy tone and skin, you know, all looks perfect. But she does look like she needs a meal. Nancy, um, um, you asked, you know, what causes her to limp? I didn't get that. Please, could you repeat? Um, I would really like, you know, to answer you, um, uh, that question. Well, um... Uh, well, you know, it could be arthritis, but um, I actually, I doubt it because, you know, if it's arthritis, that it means, um, as I know from uh, history, you know, when it's really cold and chilly, it's when it really affects, um, you know, bones, like early in the morning, early evening, but um, for her, she has been well for the last almost three weeks, and then all of a sudden today, uh, she's not well, she's limping. So I would say it is not arthritis, but if it is prolongs maybe for another, um, maybe six months to one year, then it might um, carry on to become arthritis. You see that, that, that paw that she, you know, she's putting on the sun? Uh, good dental formula. Yeah, she's got really cute, you know, beautiful teeth. So that paw you saw is the one that um, is actually she's um, it's hurting and I think she's gonna pay, play a very big role now of just sitting with the cubbies and dragging behind I think that's going to become her duty for the next maybe couple of weeks because that limp has rendered her um, ineffective so you know she might end up you know staying behind and waiting for it to heal I hope it heals much faster because she's a very important uh, part of this you know, pride, and there are only five females, so the you know she is really, really needed. Uh, that is the other female. Uh, who is that? Yeah, that is the mother of one cub. Uh, that is around four, five, four months. We haven't given her a name. Kibet, um, you ask if I think they will hunt. Yes, of course. They look like, um, you know, they, uh, they need something and they cannot get it without hunting. So they will hunt. What time? I don't know. It can be the next minute. It can be, you know, tomorrow morning. Um, you know, when I say soon, soon in Africa can mean anything from two minutes to, you know, um, you know six hours. So you never know. Um, they, will, they will be hunting, but I don't know when. Uh, that little guy there, I don't know what he's looking at. Oh, they're all here now, quite a good number of them, all, you know, encouraging each other. Um, that leaking is a strengthening of the bond, and also the saliva, I believe, it contains, you know, same smell in the same pride, so, you know, actually they can spread the scent of one another. Yeah, that's a phlegm and grimace, you know, the opening of the mouth sometimes, They'll pick up, you know, urine from other pride me pride members, and uh, sometimes they'll use an organ situated in the upper nostril of the um, nose to detect if, you know, who they are and if they are in season, and many other, you know, things. Yeah, look at her. You know, she's very playful today with her little ones. Yeah, I don't know if we're gonna see the limp. No, that's not her. That's that's not her. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna send you to Sydney, who's got some um, active lions. 
more than mine and then yeah I'll be here You can see that the female is going to the male now. Maybe you can see the tail is waving. It means now the male is being called to come for mating. Look at that. It is going to happen now. I can promise you. Oh, I think uh, the tree just disturbed them a little bit, but she's coming again. There she is. This is lovely. Listen to that. Just listen to that crowd. Ah. That was amazing. So this male, if you look at his copulatory organ, you will see that it has got some bulbs. It has got some kind of spikes, which are there for reasons. The spikes must have to scratch the copulatory passage of the female when it's drawing, uh, withdrawing in order to kickstart the process of ovulation. Without ovulation process, the female is not going to reproduce. So the ovulation process, it is a process whereby the eggs are ready for fertilization purposes. Fertilization is simply a fusion of a male and female garments in order to produce a zygote. So you can see now they are very much tired because it needs quite a lot of efforts. So every time the female must have to growl and sometimes even try to lash the male with the nail so that he, she can get rid of him because it's so painful when he's withdrawing. So it is clear that the male who doesn't have strong bubs cannot be able to reproduce with a female. So we're very lucky to see them mating. It is the second time we are seeing them since we have been here. Uh, the first time happened just during our arrival, and now it happened again. So it looks like the male doesn't have a lot of energy at the moment. He's so very much tired. I saw him trying, but I can see that also his ending part was not as impressive as, as the other times. When we got here, he was so very strong and powerful. And the female as well, when she lashed him, it was so amazing. So now it means they're going to relax for a while. They are not even following. They are not even doing it after every... A Romit, my favorite pride, it is the Unkuhumas. <laughs> the Unkuhuma pride, if you see them when they're all together, walking at night, especially during the sunset, on the road, they're just everywhere, and how they walk as a pride, you will see these are really the king of the jungles. They walk showing that they've got pri pride of being part of the royal family, the kings. <laughs> That is why I am so in love with the Unkuhuma pride. But I cannot love the Unkuhuma without loving the Avoka Kaulation. Avoka is amazing. So when uh, the Unkuhumas are all together, it's so amazing. So maybe they're not very far away from here where we are, because normally if one of them is mating, they just have to isolate themselves away from the group, from the pride, while the pride is not very far. So you can see the female now is on her deep sleep, and at least now we know that she is working very hard. We are going to expect the babies in about a three months' time.
So you can see that uh, the male just next to is trying to listen to what is happening uh, to the surrounding. But while I'm waiting for another opportunity to see the amazing mate, I am going to take you to uh, the Chobe National Park in Botswana, where Steph is just by the river having something interesting. There's an opportunity to watch elephants cross from one sand or vegetated sand bank or island to another and we are really hoping and praying that that's what we're going to see here they stopped what they were doing all of a sudden went into single file and came to a shallow entry point and it's they're going they're going they're going to swim they're going to swim they're going to cross we've got an elephant crossing and we are going to give them some space because we don't know where they're going to go you don't want to disturb them no, or are you just going to have a swim? Is that what you're doing? Just having another swim. Oh, two swims in one day. Jackpot! Let's see if the rest follow suit. Come on, in you go. Slightly older crowd this, not as many babies. similar again. Kirsty tells me that a lot of you are saying yay this is awesome. It is. It's in two swimmings in one day. Don Main you'd like to know if this water is salty or fresh water. It's fresh water Don Main. This, all this water that, uh, that we're seeing here comes from Angola and is, is rainfall water and um, there's still a couple of hundred kilometers to go before it gets to the sea and even though the Zambezi mouth does have significant tidal flow it doesn't reach this far um, and uh, one of the main reasons I think of it is because there's so many rapids in the Zambezi it's, it's, a, it's a navigable river for portions but for a lot of it uh, there's, there's just short portions, it's not a long river that you can travel up like the Nile or the Congo. Um, there are rapids, lots of them, that stop this river from being utilized as a significant sort of trade route. Now all of these elephants are in the water. This is just such a privilege everybody, I must be honest with you. Ikula, are you asking how warm the water is? Um, Ikula, I haven't been able to put a finger or a toe into this water, to be honest with you. I'm too nervous of crocodiles. So, it's definitely coolish. I would say it's probably around about, uh, let me say, 20 degrees centigrade. It's, you know, it's not warm like a warm Indian Ocean tropical water at the coast. Um, it's river water. Uh, but not mountain stream cold, if that makes any sense. Now, elephants are a tactile species. They enjoy being close to one another. They enjoy touching one another. And what they're doing there is they're just enjoying a swim, a lot less energetic than the previous swim that, uh, that we witnessed. This is just a lot calmer. There's a little baby there trunk up because that baby is actually swimming it's not standing at the moment mr tuvok you'd like to know if this water is clean enough for humans to drink mr tuvok um there's so many settlements on the side of this river and you know uh personally i wouldn't drink it without purifying it if if uh, if that answers your question i mean it's not like there's people everywhere in huge cities or anything like that but I definitely would purify it and, I, you know, I think it's a clever idea. Have we been drim drinking river water since we've been in, uh, in Kasani? Absolutely. I have no doubt that the water that's coming out of our taps uh, is purified straight from the river. I've been drinking it since I got here and have had no problems at all. So, just look at this. We've got a pile-up. This is just a proper wrestle going on here. And that little baby, I have no doubt, is swimming. It's not standing. It might be standing on its back feet. But just judging from how deep these other elephants are in the water. And that's that big elephant standing. That baby is definitely underneath. There you can see its head just sticking out. So it's kicking using its feet. And it's just natural buoyancy to 
keep it afloat. Look at their color. I just love the color of a wet elephant. It's just this beautiful gray color and with the green behind them and the blue and the yellow of the sun, their white tusks. It's just such a lovely color. I'm a big fan of cement work in, uh, oh, sorry, my ears have fallen up. I'm a big fan of cement work in construction, especially dark cement. And uh, I have a real liking for the color that these elephants are, especially when you contrast it against all the other colors that naturally occur out here. The sky reflecting in the water, white clouds, white tusks, green grass, brown mud. Sol, you'd like to know if there are leeches in the water. There are leeches in the water here, Sol. I'm convinced of it. Um, the Linyanti Swamp is upriver of where we are now, and there'll be lots of leeches in that swamp. And this river water came through the Linyanti Swamp before coming here. And, uh, and back into the Chobe Channel, and so yes, I think that there's probably a lot of leeches here. This elephant smelt something on the wind. You can see what a respectful distance that we are keeping away from uh, from from all of these elephants. We're not disturbing them, um, and it's just testimony to the level and skill of the guides out here. Just full respect to the animals and the wildlife around. just having a proper swim. So enough food in their mouth and they decided that's done. Swimming is where it's at. Really cool. There's just three of us in this particular sighting. Or three boats I should say. Probably about as many uh, as many people as we find around a lion sighting or an elephant sighting in the Kruger Park. I wouldn't say that there's an astronomical amount of people here. And with so many different elephant sightings up and down the river, it's easy to spread yourself out. I'm sure in the, in the dry season uh, or the high season, and there's thousands of elephants here and lots and lots of tourists, it gets a bit busier, but it's relatively short-lived. And I think for the rest of the year, we have these rather special, intimate sightings with uh, these alleys. Trunks up. Cooling down, hugging each other, just re reaffirming the social bonds with one another by a shared experience. By definition, a proper family. All right, in contrast, we I think we're going to send you away to some other Ellies that are nowhere near any water and see what they're up to. Welcome back to South Africa and well we have found some elephants of our own and well they are cooling down by flapping their ears. Steph they don't have the luxury of a very nice cold river to go swim in although there are lots of watching holes they could go swim in but they generally don't do too much of it down here. A chobe seems to be quite a common thing and you can see that they just enjoy it. It's not just about cooling down, it's also about enjoyment. And that's how we can relate to, to elephants because you know, when you look at children, human children, we can swim all day long. You know, eventually you get parents have to pull the kids out to the water and say, come on now, it's time to dry off. Otherwise kids will just play in the pool all day long. I can do the same thing all day long. And the temperatures are at that sort of level. It's lovely to just play. But wonderful small herd of elephants here. We've got a couple bulls with them. That's a big bull you see there. Busy grazing, a nice decent set of tusks on him. Really decent set. See how smooth it is on the bottom there. Um, that is a characteristic feature when the tusks are worn down on the bottom. Let me just reposition here. Seb, I'll just go forward. When the tusks are worn down on the bottom, um, in the Kruger, there's lots of concrete sort of reservoirs where water's kept. And it's quite a common feature for elephants to stick their head over and into that. And that um, concrete sort of trough or reservoir is known to grind down their tusks. Monica, you say they don't have access to a river. Well, they definitely don't have access to a permanent river here. 
but they do have access to the dams the large watering holes to to swim if they want to but well, we don't generally see it too often. We've seen them at Chitwa a few times having a proper little swim. Here's a mama here coming with no tusks. It is part of the population, tuskless females. Um, you don't often find too many tuskless males in the Kruger. Look how much bigger that bull is at the back there. Oh, hello, mama. You're gonna come right past us, are you? Oh, her tusks are there. They're actually just very small stubs. What a magnificent bull. Actually not as worn down as I thought initially, and he's in must. We're just going to sit here and, and watch. He's dribbling, but he is eating. Hasn't shown any discomfort to our presence. Don't worry, sir. We're not going to cause trouble for you and your ladies. I promise you that. Magnificent specimen, isn't he? There we go. Walking downhill. He's just coming into must back of his legs actually you can see that um, his legs aren't really even that wet so it's just a new stage of must and well he's probably sensing estrus in some of these females as you can see he's hot on their tails okay well as we move on from these elephant they're looking like they're going north into Bifelsuk we're going to send you back up to Isaac in the Mara who's possibly moved off from his lions or has he found them some dinner okay I'm trying to cross this section here because uh, we just wanted to get closer to the buffaloes and they're to my left at the same time have a picture of the lions and so I'm going to try and position somewhere back here. Um, and these are the animals that the buffalo, the lions, uh, want to go for. And they're quite a distance away, so let me talk quickly and uh, share what is happening with you. That is what we see from where I am. Those are the buffaloes in front. You see them over there. Um, they're all, they're all, you know, wondering, you know, what I'm doing here, um, and looking at me, but the lions are quite a distance to the left. Yeah, I'm quite far away, so I'm not, you know, disturbing them in any way. This is a big herd of male buffaloes, which are almost, you know, th you know, three or four times the size of a fully grown lioness. So I wonder if they're going to go for these guys. But they all looked very determined. I had to leave where they are so that I could give them a chance not to be detected. Um, if you zoom in, you'll see how far they are. They're quite a long ways back there. This is the view that I have here. And uh, the lionesses are somewhere, you know, over there. I don't know. Yeah, you see her? She's moving. Um, is that, was that her? No, 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 she's not her. Uh, she's somewhere there. I'm looking for her. Uh, can we see any? Yes, there they are. Uh, in between the termite mound, you see them, those are the lions, and only you can see their heads peeping in the long grass. They're quite long ways away. So we've left where we were, and we want to give them a good, you know, distance for them to be able to do their own natural thing without us interfering. You see, the buffaloes have gone back to their normal. Okay, um, while I wait here for the you know, buffaloes to drink and think what they want to do, let me send you, send, send you back to Steph in um, Chobe. These Ellies are just finishing up their swim, unlike those lions, which haven't even started their buffalo hunt yet. And uh, they're just standing on the bank here eating a bit of the reeds in the grass as... Uh, as they're finished off, that little baby, he's deciding that he's just going to make the most of every single second of this bath and he's still porpoising and acting like a whale. Whereas the adults and the sub-adults have decided that that's enough and uh, are starting to eat, just standing in the water, keeping their feet nice and cold or their toes nice and cold. Let's see how they get up here. See that cow, she's got some pigmentation behind her skin, which is uh, behind her ears, which is unusual to see. So the big female on the left hand side has got an unusual pigmentation or lack of pigmentation behind her ears. 
And she could have been born with that. It could be some scarring of a sort. I don't know. It's I don't know enough about elephant, and I don't see them bathing enough. What are you doing? She's shoving her tusks into the lawn. Oh, she's looking for some sand to throw on her head, some decoration. So she's using her tusks to leverage up tufts of grass and sand, and she's then using that to throw over her back. That's incredible. What weird behavior. We've almost forgotten about the fact that we've got three completely submerged. There we go, some more sand and decoration. Maybe she just wants to make herself look pretty today. I was quite enjoying that particular grass. One elephant is still submerged in the throng there, that little one. Oh, there she's now putting her bum into the sand, giving it a good scratch. <laughs> I've actually seen the compressed banks for the last two days and wondered what was making it. Now I know it's elephant bums. Lady Starfire, I'd like to know what age the, lady, the, elephant, the moms would allow their babies to swim. Um, lady Starfire, I think as soon as they are independent enough to want to swim, I think is the answer. I mean, I've seen tiny babies swimming. Um, they can't always get into the deep end and very often mom has to, uh, mom has to intervene and give a helping hand in a strong current or trunk, leg for a bit of leverage. But no babies can swim. She's having a proper decoration. She's now got grass all over her head. And, and I see the other one has followed suit. In fact, what's happened is they've all started to mirror her, uh, her behavior. It's very weird just watching them gouge out those massive chunks of grass and then throw it over her head. I mean, it's not to keep her cool, she's not getting warm at the moment. It's not to stop biting flies, because that's better done by mud and sand. It's just a bit of decoration. There she makes some mud now, so kicking up the mud. Imagine being kicked by that elephant. It should kick you into a different postal code. You know, this is just behavior that we just don't see so often. Anna-Marie, you'd like to know if it's very hot this afternoon. It is. It's, it's not temperature-wise it's not that hot, Anna-Marie. I think it's probably around about 25, maybe 24, but the sun is super intense um, and, uh, and really has, it's, it's, it's very clear. The air is very clear and so the sunlight is super intense. It's not burning as much as what it does in the Mara, to be honest with you. Um, but typical of Botswana, I, a couple of times that I've been here in my life, Late afternoon sun is just, you just can't get away. It's spiky. Look at these illies now just rolling in the mud. Isn't that so spectacular? You know, we're not really paying enough attention to the fact that we just don't see this behavior anywhere where we have operations. It's just unique to the Chobe River and other places, a few places in Africa. Look at that one upside down, leg kicking in the air. And in the background is Kasani. In the background there is Kasani village. And that's where we stay. That's on the borders of the Chobe National Park and where you can fly into and the, the biggest town in this particular area. Well, it's a village really, it's not really even a town. <laughs> Leg in there, did you get that, Debbie? It is. What's that? Ah, so we're still busy looking at these Elies. a really nice oh there we go that is also a comment of what elephant do they tend to just defecate as hard as what they can as soon as they get into the water whenever they have a swim that one's got a properly runny tummy as well just could be a sign of just the overabundance of water that you have over here it not necessarily means that they're sick there's one getting out what she's going to battle to get out but watch that watch watch how the big one at the back gets out very difficult for elephants to actually climb but they are actually a lot more uh, maneuverable than what you think they look cumbersome but in actual fact an elephant will get up a bank easier from deeper water than what we could as humans and she's not going to get up there it's a bit higher there she's going to just let her and the reason being is that 60 percent of their weight is over their front legs 
And if they haven't got decent leverage, they actually can't get their back up. <laughs> They're just having an absolute poo fest over here at the moment. They can make relatively... For, for animals that enjoy drinking clean water, I promise you, they can make a clean body of water relatively disgusting quite quickly. See, like you said, they look so happy. I agree with you, these elephants do look happy. A lot less frenetic or active than the last elephant that we saw. They are at peace, this young elephant herd or the small elephant herd. This female now, she's washed all the decorations off of her head that she so painstakingly uh, took her time to put there. And now it's time for another swim. I haven't quite finished the swim. Kids aren't finished yet, so you might as well go join them. This other one is still busy gouging massive chunks of vegetation out. Look at that. There's just something about a late afternoon sunlit elephant in the Chobe that just makes it, doesn't it? Don't you think? Forest bush in the background, sparkly blue water. I can describe the wind that's coming off. There's a, there's a, although the sun is quite sharp, the, the wind that's coming off of the river is quite fresh. And it's blowing from the elephant to us. So I've got this lovely, fresh smelling grassy breeze blowing in our, in our faces. It smells like wet elephant. And just a, Amelia, you're loving watching this, Kirsty tells me. And, uh, I think a lot of people are feeling exactly the same way as you are, Amelia. I'm also loving this. And everyone around us, big smiles on their faces, big thumbs up. They're going to cross. They're going to cross. Everyone has left, and we're going to get the crossing all to ourselves. That is what patience buys you, everybody. We are now seeing an elephant crossing into the deep water. Notice that the baby elephant are swimming in the mother's wake with a big elephant at the back to push with the trunk and help support all the babies. So that is a very deliberate and very, and that is how they cross. Mother forging the way ahead, keeping the direction. Baby swimming off. They're actually swimming, they're kicking with their feet. Mother might also be swimming with an adult elephant at the back. Busy lending support to the youngsters. They won't be putting their trunk on them. Trunk out forward, all the senses extended. And a real big treat. This is a, a, a real privilege, everybody. And they're now coming up into the shallows. They cross the deeper side. The babies will start being able to stand right now. And just epic. Really, really, really cool. Now they're coming out. Did you see the youngster in the middle, exactly where the wake would have been? Uh, it would have had the least amount of turbulence. In fact, it would have been pulled along by the by the turbulence that the ones in front of it would have created. She's a little bit indecisive. She's a little bit indecisive. Let's see where she wants to go. This is so close we are. We are about 15 yards away from these elephants at the moment. Lauren, you said that was magical. I must be honest with you, that was the first time I've ever seen elephant, this many elephant crossing in a river. I abs absolutely agree with you. Magic. I wonder why this female doesn't want to get up onto the island. There must be something there that's bothering her. There are some water buck that are just on the other side. Are you going to swim back across now? Don't tell me you're going to swim back across. Are you ready? Now, I'd like you to note when you replay this in your memory that these elephants got themselves into that formation without a word being said. Now, the next time you're in a shopping centre and you watch your mom trying to get kids in line, have a look at how many words are spoken before the kids actually get into line. It makes you think about the obedience of intelligent animals, right? 
I know that I run out of words trying to get my boy in line in the shopping centre to basically give up. He's crossed a busy road, for lack of a better word. No, no, no verbalisation needed. Back again in that formation. It's quite dangerous here. That baby elephant can still get swept away. The danger of a big crocodile will be lurking inside that mom's head. This baby hasn't finished swimming yet. I wonder if he's going to get reprimanded by one of the, the older ones. He's like, get up and stop playing, man. Come on. You've had in a half an hour of swimming. What I'm finding amazing is the fact that this female is choosing to walk parallel to the bank. She's not getting out onto the onto the bank. She's choosing to walk parallel. And it's definitely the, the lead cow, because when she flaps open her ears, I can actually see that pigmentation that she's got. You can see that youngster still keeping very tight to the older elephant. The reason for that is because that is the safest place to be. Least chance to be washed away, greatest chance to be helped if there's, if there's a problem. And out onto the island and you can just see how lush that grass is. Just immediately a mouthful of grass into their faces. Total delight. All the African jacanas flying in here from all over the place to come and feast on the bonanza that the elephant's feet would be kicking up. A bunch of cattle egrets flying in also make the most of the elephant's disturb disturbing the insects and we've just got jacana after jacana flying in here. That female she's got a massive tuft of grass. Yes, that it was just an absolutely proper sighting of Ellie's crossing, don't you think? And they will probably spend the night on this island. Lots of food, relatively safe. Where else would they go? And right here for tomorrow. Ooh. That was just really, really, really cool. Right. Well, I'm just going to take in what I've just seen. We're going to send you over to Steve. Thank you, Steph. Sounds like you're having a wonderful time up there. Yeah, oh, very, very blessed. Well, we're about to emerge at the Juma Den site. I haven't seen them in some time holding fingers that they're going to be there. We're timing it so we feel like it's going to be the right time of day for the Juma clan to be in attendance. I hope so. What do we all think? Do we think they're going to be there? Yes? No? I hope so. See a little plonk. The two new little ones. First see if they're using their um, plunge pool. There's no one in the plunge pool at the moment. Just pop our nose in here. 30 seconds and we will see what we can see. And yay! They're here everybody. They're outside of the den as well. Hello, Plonk. Where are you running? Oh, they're two young ones. These are... That's not Plonk. I don't know who that is. Two of Pretty's youngsters, I think. Yes, Plonk is on the right over here suckling. And these are two... These are Pretty's two youngsters. Very good, Juma Den. Welcome. Hello, guys. How are you doing? See, they're looking a little bit like... What's going on? Haven't seen a car in a while. Hello. What are you doing? If it's got a big fat tick on the inside of its ear. Yes, look at that tick there. Oh no. <laughs> Hello guys. Oh, there's a little one coming out, Seb. There we go. Hello, little one. <laughs> oh, this is so special. Thank you, Hukumuri, for showing us this den. Those of you who don't remember, Hukumuri led us here. And uh, now we have the Juma Den once again. 
And let's see, um, the little, the smallest there is one of um, June's youngsters. And we'll see how she behaves, or it behaves, with these two others. Because um, that is, the social standing starts to sort of work at this sort of stage. There's two pretties, two youngsters are... They're a little bit, they're not 100% relaxed, you know. Corky is on the right-hand side over here with Plonk having a little bit of a suckle. Here comes the second little one out there. We'll wait for this action to die down on this side, and then we'll reposition to get a better view. There we go. This is the, the standard greeting of hyenas, the lifting of the leg, except the other youngster's supposed to do the same thing. It's a reciprocal gesture, basically showing off your most v private part Okay, let's quickly go over to the lion action. Just listen to that. That was amazing. I think he did very well this time because the last time it was not as rough as now. As I can see, the reaction of the female has just shown me that uh, he did very well. And congratulations to this very uh, big male for managing to do it very well this time. So you can see that now this is amazing. You can see that they're just passing very close to us. Look at this. So now, uh, let's uh, cross over back to Steve and see the hyenas as the lions are now moving much more towards our property. I don't have to worry at all. Thank you, sitters. I'm sure that was, and you had a feeling it wasn't going to last very long. Lion mating is never very long indeed. And here we've got the two very inquisitive ones coming right up to the car. Who knows what we've driven in today. Right here, hello. Tick ear. <laughs> so they're smelling all sorts of things. So these two that are practically under the car at the moment are, are corkies. Are not corkies, pretties, youngsters. And these other two are Junes. And we believe it to be Junes' first litter. And I haven't seen her. She's not here at the moment. Maybe she's around the corner sticking out of the other hole there. We just can't see. But it's fantastic. I suppose when, when the corky's around or one of the mums is around, that's when you'll have the cubs out. The last f three or four times we've come, there's been no... <laughs> what are they doing there, Seb? <laughs> They're right under the car now. When we, um, every other time we come, there's been no adults. And so that's when the youngsters will stay underground. They don't generally come out if there's no safety. Uh, there's a confidence of having a matriarch or having mum around. It definitely does embolden the youngsters. And Lauren, I haven't heard from Jamie, but Lauren was quite upset. She, uh, on Instagram, she posted a broken heart icon at how jealous she was that we found the den site, I think, two days after she left. So she's super excited, of course, that we've got it. Um, but she's not going to be back here for some time. She's going to be going to the Mara after her leave. She's gone back home to Scotland, and she'll be in the Mara on her next journey. So by the time she comes back here, these two youngsters that are completely black will probably be spotted and looking a little bit like Plonk does. But it's great to see the sausage tree pride in the north growing in numbers and the Juma clan doing the same. Very, very fortunate to have such little bundles of joy running around. Look, I've got a stick. <laughs> you love the creases on their heads, eh, Seb? Mm. <laughs> oh, look, I ate the stick. Can you imagine if you left a pair of shoes here, how long they would last? <laughs> Yes, you are very cute. You are gorgeous, in fact, you're with your little feet. You can see the, the, the claws are, are out in, in um, hyena. And we see the little lion cubs and the leopard cubs, their claws are not visible. But where's, oh, did you see that youngster just pasted on that little branch on the bottom left that's now moving? 
at the little pasting. So hyenas will paste for territorial markings around their territory. And the youngsters will practice the pasting. You'll see when they sort of move their anal gland, which is just below the anus. They do this little squatting motion and they drag it over a little branch or a little stick or something quite low to the ground. And then that leaves a sort of a dark sort of viscous paste on there that generally has got a very foul smell. Um, and the youngsters, they practice around the den. And the adults will do those pastings in a sort of territorial signposts around their territory. And those pastings actually have sort of all sorts of communication signatures that will tell other hyenas uh, the strength of the clan, the sort of the sexual maturity of the individual, uh, all sorts of things that we can only really postulate at. And what's very interesting is the brown hyena actually does two pastings. One is short-lived and one is much longer-lived due to the fact that they are such... Uh, it's more, more nomadic and they cover a much larger area so it takes them a lot longer to get back to a sort of point of interest like that certainly let's um invite some more people on board nina and show them what's going on with the juma den we haven't seen them in a few days Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Juma in the Sawi Sands, where we have come across the Juma Den uh, with a four or five of the young cubs in attendance. And obviously, as soon as we went live with you there, they decided to go on to the other side of the mound. Good evening. My name is Steve, and I'm joined by Sebastian on camera. And we're just going to move up a little bit and show you. I think they might come out. There's another hole on that side. But before we move around, oh, there we go. <laughs> it's one of the youngsters. This is um, one of the, the two. There we go. The other youngster is going to come back. These two that you can see in shot now, one is just the feet. Uh, these two youngsters are five, six months old, and they are the daughters of Pretty, or the son and daughter of Pretty, who I haven't seen in some time. And we found this den again only last week or so, and it's nice to come back and to see these youngsters. We didn't see these two. Uh, they, they were probably with Pretty at another den for a period of time, but now they've come to join in this communal den because you might have seen those two black ones. There we go. It's popping its head out. There's another one about to come on the top as well, Seb. Coming on the top. There we go. These are two of the newest members. You can see how dark they are. And, well, they are the first litter and the newest litter and to a uh, very low-ranking female by the name of June. Um, and so they're very, very young. Valerie, this is very cool. Very, very cool indeed to be able to see these youngsters out and about. It's got a lot to do with the fact that the matriarch is in attendance. She's not in the best position for us to show her to you now. She's just on our right-hand side suckling her single cub by the name of Plonk. And while well, the other two, or the other four, are basically sitting around probably waiting for their mums to come back. Because hyena can suckle from anywhere from eight months to over a year. Um, and that's how they're able to sort of survive around the den because it's only the matriarch who's allowed to bring food back to the den. Well, not necessarily allowed, but if a low-ranking individual brought food back, it would just get wolfed up by all the others that are more high-ranking than her. So they don't bring food back, but they are able to give them the youngsters milk for a very extended period of time. This youngster enjoying the comforts of the side of the den <laughs> a little bit of grooming. You see the spots that come through. The spots start coming through at about two and a half to three months. And then they're pretty much fully spotted by four and a half, five months. Uh, so that little one you see that's black there will start getting a few spots on its bottom. Whereas the shoulders and head will still stay quite dark. And then it'll slowly start to change to then call them the Spotted Hyenas. Christine, you love the name Plonk. Well, uh, I think it's quite an interesting name. And uh, I, I don't actually even know how it came about. I, I tried to ask a little while ago. I was on leave when it came about, and it's one of those names that stuck. I don't think it was intended by James, James Hendry, to give the animal that name. I think he came up with it, and it just became a viewer favorite. <laughs> And now it is there. You're not going to change his name at all. But uh, the hyenas born or erupted, born with erupted teeth. So 
So they have got teeth from the day they're born. Bert, you love these creatures. Well, that is something about hyenas that we've able to be, we've been able to do with our show. We've been able to change the mindset and the perception most people have of these lowly scavengers of the African plains that just steal food and cause havoc. Well, they are social. They are energized. They are cute. They are funny. Now they have personalities all unto their own. And isn't that just a precious little thing right there? <laughs> Here we go. It's going to come and say hello. Come say hello to the camera, little one. Where is your mum? We'd love to see your mum. There's a bit of good chance that they might have suckled already. Generally, after suckling, the youngsters have got a little bit of energy. And that's why they're running around the way they are. And forget, folks, you can please send in any comments and questions below. We'd love to, to hear from you and answer them. I heard a, a Franklin make a bit of a shout behind me there. Did you see how that youngster suddenly made a big beeline for the hole, but then looked at the other youngster and noticed it hadn't moved? That is the safety, the security of these youngsters. They don't venture too far from the hole. Um, just in the last week, we've had at least more than one leopard. Three leopards in the space of a few days sort of arrived on the scene here. And so the hyenas need to be vigilant. A leopard would very, very readily snap up one of these youngsters. They are their competitors. Hello, Dr. Fujam. It is not the mother. This one you see on the left is, in fact, a five-and-a-half, six-month-old youngster. Um, the adults are much bigger than that. I'll move up for you now, and then we can see. I'll show you who not only the mother is... It's not this one's mother, but the matriarch of the clan. She's sitting on the side of me here with her, her offspring, who is enjoying a very, very good suckle from mum. There's Corky, uh, the dominant female of this clan. And that is Plonk right there, enjoying the safest and most comfortable spot on mum's belly and now Plonk is an individual an only child and hyenas generally have two and so there'll always be a battle for sort of uh, suckling rights and positioning and Plonk being the only individual is able to access and have full rights to mum whereas if there were two they would be competing for that best spot there tucked up nicely underneath Corky's belly you see how, how cozy does that look and they can suckle for 20 to 30 minutes, 40 minutes at a time, at least three to four times a day in the beginning. And, well, that's very nutrient-rich milk, which is going to help Plonk to develop into very strong and healthy young hyena. But before we go, Seb, just one more view over there, because that is the cutest little picture right there. Before we say goodbye to all of you, one more shot of our hyenas coming to say hello they're very interested in all of you and if you'd like to continue watching we are still live for another 20 minutes or half an hour or so so just google safari live we'd love to hear from you until next time thanks for your questions and comments and have a beautiful evening Welcome back, everybody. Isn't this just precious? Forgive me if I just have a quick drink of water there. So there's a, a nice little bit of love between these individuals. There's not animosity. You would expect there to be a little bit of biting and shoving. At the moment, it's all intrigue and inquisitiveness. But anyway, while we stay with these hyenas, let's go to their mortal enemy up in the Masai Mara with Isaac. Okay, um, all the females are moving around there is one female kinky tail who's gone quite a distance far away we cannot see her remember we are on infrared and we can um, that's the farthest we can see but she's gone around 
a long ways around and I think she's trying to push the buffaloes towards us so that I know she these ones are flanking so just in case you know they come come down this way these ones are gonna get it but the buffaloes are right in front of me it's pitch dark um, and we only switch on the lights you know so that it can illuminate me but before it was all dark I cannot see anything I'm using the help of uh, you know infrared to be able to see you know how you know where they are but they are in front of me somewhere and the lions have gone round and I think Kinky Tail is going to push the buffalo towards this way and then these ones flanking you know might get something but at the moment you know they're somewhere in the dark here they're all moving actually you can see one I think to the left here there is I don't know which one it is here actually um, I don't know who is this this could be Limpy because she's the one who's limping and you can tell she's listening um, using eyesight at the same time listening it's total darkness here and I can't see even um, a meter myself but you can tell she's focused she's looking at the same time listening to the left where she's facing now is where the buffaloes are yeah no that's not limpy yeah she's headed straight towards the buffalo now and I don't know at any moment you know they might be chased towards this way I don't know who else is around here maybe if you sweep slightly to the right Archie see if we can see another female that are, are that are flanking they are waiting um yeah there they are that's another one that's waiting you see how spread out they are this is the strategy they normally use um you know they just wait you see how a lot just waiting for that trigger to hear the hooves coming towards this way if they're lucky they head this way then you know they might get something but they're all spread out in a line in front of me quite a distance and you see there's another one over there i don't know who's that Maybe that's one of the cubs. He's coming back. He feels like you know it's going to be dangerous, so it's coming towards where the females are, just in case you know the the buffalo stampede doesn't get trampled. Kinky tail disappeared into the darkness off to our right over there, and we can't see her anymore. And um, any moment something might happen, but it's hard to tell, you know, um, which way the buffalo are gonna go. You see these ones, they, you know. We are actually illuminating using infrared lights, um, but we can't see anything, even the lions. Um, they actually, I think the, uh, okay, she's moving. I don't know what she had. Okay, stretch, getting ready, uh, getting those muscles ready for action. Um, actually, now I can tell they are moving much more free. Okay, you know, while I wait here um, to see what happens, let me take you down to Steph, who's in Chobe, and see what he's up to. Look at that fantastic sunset. Isn't that wonderful? Now, this is our last segment for the day, and probably from uh, the Chobe River in Botswana for now, and we've got someone who just wants to say hello to you right now. So hello to Graham, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's great to be over here in Chobe. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're, this is our last time that you'll be seeing us for the moment from Botswana, but um, it's our plan to, uh, to be back here again soon once we've got everything organized, and we'll hopefully be coming to you uh, on a daily basis from the Chobe River for a while. Uh, not sure exactly when that's going to happen, but, um, but we're definitely working on it. Today has been amazing. To watch those, to watch those elephants <clears throat> crossing over the river was super incredible. That's the first time we've ever had anything like that on Safari Live. Um, and an absolute privilege to bring it all to you. Um, so, I don't know, to just be out here with you guys, Steph, Darvi, thank you very much. Yeah. Kaiser in the back, thank you guys for, for driving us around. It's been amazing. Uh, this truly is a special place as you've seen. So many elephant, hippos. We're not even in the season yet. When the dry season comes, there'll be even more. And uh, we're looking forward to bringing it to you. Eh? Kirsty says that everyone's saying thank you very much for bringing this to you or bringing this to them. And, uh, you know, lots of goodwill and good uh, good wishes. Oh, excellent. I mean, thank you very much, everyone. And I've been seeing all your, all your comments on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere. And I can see how much you're enjoying it as much as we've been enjoying it. We've managed to uh, turn Steph into a strawberry, as many of you have mentioned on Twitter, <laughs> which is uh, an achievement on its own. Uh, strawberry Steph. Uh, <laughs> but it's been great. Uh, 
Uh, Thank you very much, and we look forward to being back here real soon with you all. Becky says, Tiger's next, Graham. What's next? Yeah, well, we, uh, we, 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 we spent some time in India um, uh, trying to do Tigers, and we're going to carry on doing that. And uh, you can expect some more surprises coming uh, over the coming months, both above and below the water. Um, and uh, just keep watching, and you'll, uh, you won't be disappointed. So super excited there. Thank you very much, Graham. That's awesome. All right, Chris, that's uh, the sunset, and uh, it's going down. And there are a lot better things to look at than my strawberry colored head, since we've got lions on the hunt with Isaac. So off you go. We'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye. Okay, this lioness is waiting for the others to do the chase. Um, it's quite a distance from us and actually I think he's wondering what is taking too long because the buffaloes are not very far. Actually I think they're about 100 meters. We can't see them but they're somewhere up there. I don't know if we can see them. Um, they're somewhere in the dark there. Believe me, there's some buffalo there. Yeah, we're not pulling your leg. There is something there and the lions can see and hear. Uh, but we can't see a thing. It's total dark and it's, uh, it's like that. Yeah. That's how dark it is. And we're using the infrared. Even myself driving, I had to use the spotlight and just sign in front so that I don't illuminate everything. And so the buffaloes might, could have seen the lionesses. Um, they all have flanked the buffalo like that. They're off to my right. And uh, let's see if we can find them for you. They're somewhere, you know, they're, they're, you know in the dark. Uh, we have lost them somewhere there. Um, there it is. There's one. There's one. And they're all in the dark, waiting for one to do make a move. Um, I don't know how long it will take, but they, they have all surrounded the buffalo. You see, that's one. Sweep to the left a little bit more. Yeah, let's see if there's another one. A little bit more, a little bit more. Where's the other one? Uh, yeah, it's disappeared there somewhere. Yeah. So they are, they are spread out. They're quite a distance from us. That one has lied down. Um, sometimes it looks like they're doing nothing but one is just waiting for the other to make a move and then there is action and uh, you know they might be lucky they might not be lucky remember their success rate is not very good is almost around 60% so it's not as good um, she's you see see that posture tells me she's trying to reposition without being noticed Minamu, thank you for your question and always nice to hear that you are tuned in to Safari Life. Um, does the wind prevent them you know, from you know, making a hunt? No, it's actually an added advantage this time around because they are down, downwind and the buffaloes are upwind. So it's an added advantage and uh, it is, uh, means that uh, their success rate can go up um, a, you know, when the wind is like this. But every now and then it changes and that can be detrimental or that can twist, make, you know, twist the th things around if it changes and, you know, heads towards the buffalo. But so far, so good. Everything is happening, you know, um, quite fast. I don't know how far they've gone that way. And um, we don't like interfering. We like, you know, leaving nature to take its course. So, you know, I'm just gonna um, drive a little bit more in front, then stop and just wait. And when I hear action is when I'm gonna put on my lights and maybe heads towards whatever it's happening. Otherwise, it would be nice if we can um, to get closer. Um, let me move forward a little bit. Let's move forward a little bit, Achi. You see, um, if I illuminate like that, you will see the buffalo over there. But um, Shru, you say you know. Th thank you for the wonderful drive. Yes, welcome. Uh, always my pleasure. You know to give you a good drive. Yeah, let's move forward a little bit and then stop and see what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to try and head away from everybody and hopefully. You know, 
uh, we can get the action going before the end of the drive. Everybody's off to my right. I'm gonna switch off the right lights, then turn. Yes, you know, let's let's take you to Sydney, who's got some meeting lines while we wait out and see what's happening over here. Uh, the female lion was just roaring now and the male is not interested. And I'm very sure the male is not interested to exaggerate the roar because he doesn't like uh, to invite any competition at the moment. So the female was just roaring, roaring, try to let all the other Unkuhuma pride members about here yeah, about. And this male is not interested at all. So I can see that he is uh, just next to uh, that female uh, seated. Look at that. Uh, this is amazing. Look at those uh, beautiful and nice uh, canines. So the teeth of these animals are so very much powerful. They even got the uh, teeth which are strong enough to crush bones. You can see that this female is looking very much concerned at the moment. She must be thinking about uh, the other Pride members. Look at the ears are so very much wary. So by this time of the day is when the lions naturally are going to become active. active. So at the moment, the possibilities of them to wake up and start moving, they are very much high. So during the day, their movement are so much restricted because of the level of the star. The star I am talking about is the sun, as the sun is our nearest star. So I'm trying to listen to hear if maybe the other ones are replying. Because two days ago, when I saw this female somewhere on the road, Triple M, the other ones were deep in the thick bushes there. Maybe they are not very far away from the other closely related members. But I can guarantee you, the safest lion at the moment in Juma Game Reserve is this female, because she's under a very strong scrutiny and a very strong a supervision and protection of this majestic, beautiful male. He is going to do whatever it takes <laughs> to, pro uh, to protect this female. So the male is now charging uh, to uh, roar. I saw that now. Look at that. I thought he was going to roar because he did uh, promise a little bit. I was hoping for that. But now that he is not showing any sign of carrying on roaring, I am uh, going to take you back to uh, Steve, who is having a lovely hyena sighting. Welcome back, everybody. We are surrounded by these little cubs. They are all around. One even, I wasn't looking, and it came and sniffed my foot. And they're right here. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, there's Corky calling. started giving Plonk a proper licking and he stopped feeding and these two naughty little ones are right next to me. You want to climb in the car with me do you? It is so close folks you can't even get him on camera. He's right here. I'm going to bop him on the nose in a minute. You don't want Hyena to suddenly get to the point thinking you can start nibbling on your foot while you're not watching. Very inquisitive. So Corky sort of 
got Plonk off of her. He stood up, he came and joined the other two. And all three of them came up and were giving our vehicle a proper, proper investigation. And then I was having a look away and I felt something wet touch the side of my foot. And, uh, well, that was indeed the nose of these hyenas. <laughs> Here comes Plonk. Plonk, that was your mom calling. She's so powerful, isn't she? It's probably time for all of you to go back inside. You might have noticed, sorry to not have mentioned it earlier, we've gone into the IR spectrum because the light has just gotten to that level where it's not that easy to see. You see, Plonk is a very... Which one's Plonk now? I thought I... This is, I think Plonk is that one on the left there, the darker of the two. Yeah. This other one has gone right underneath my car. Let's come back. Stop it now, little one. I'm going to have to bonk you on the nose. He's not at all scared. <laughs> it's not scared at all. That is the, the hyenas. <laughs> there he is. He is being very cheeky. Well, she, I can't tell at the moment. Very, very cheeky. I said, no, don't smell my shoe. It keeps coming back. <laughs> it's very special though to be able to spend time like this with hyenas. I know that the light is starting to fade. Uh, they're probably going to go into their burrow soon because the adults, well, we've only seen one. It was Corky. She's moved off there. You heard her calling, the rallying cry of the troops, maybe trying to find out where the rest of her sisters or family are so that they can maybe go and find some food. You get many different communication calls with hyena. Ooh, it's kind of that early evening call just to sort of like we do with our radio to say good afternoon mobile station so everybody knows we're out and then we can all come together or maximize our search image or search area so that we can find animals and hyena are the same they will cover an enormous area in the search of scraps and food well while we move on from these very cute and boisterous cheeky hyenas this afternoon let's go back up to the sausage tree pride and see how they're getting along with their buffalo hunt okay welcome back um i'm trying to find somewhere to cross i've crossed i've come across a very tricky spot to cross but and the lions have gone across the other side it's to cross so that I can follow them. Uh, these are the obstacles we face sometimes when you come across a permanent stream like this. It becomes very difficult to, to cross and you don't want to get stuck. So you have to be really careful where you, you want to, you know, to, to cross. It doesn't help when you have a million flies flying over your face, like right now. Um, is this a good spot? Yes, it is. Let's try this one. Yes, I can see them. They've gone across the other side. So, that's where I want to follow them. And see what they're doing. Hold tight. Hold tight, Archie. Hold tight. Right, we are across. Okay, let's take you to Sydney while I try and get close to these lions and see what they're doing. So you can see that I'm still here with the mating pair and the mating pair has just done it again about a few seconds ago. They are just finished now. We did not manage to show you the real action because they just decided to start running and got disappeared here in the thick grass. Look at that. Look at that very beautiful mane. I'm very sure that female is giving him a chance because she is so highly impressed with this very beautiful look. So from the road, I can promise you to hear where they are, it's not easy. The prey animals can even come here without 
knowing that these big predators are hiding somewhere. It's just that they are not interested on any hunting. As I saw the impalas passing by earlier, all they are interested on is to multiply through this reproduction process. So you can see that ES is so very much dark here behind that ear, which is something very important for their non-verbal communication. The black tips together with the tassel at the tip of the tail makes it much more easier for them to communicate below the, the, below the hearing. So these very beautiful and majestic animals are leading us to the end of the broadcast. And thank you very, very much for your questions and comments. It has been an ornament having you this afternoon with all the interesting animals, all the way from uh, Botswana, Shobe National Park and Kruger National Park.